Hey, first of everything, uh, thanks so much, Ivana, for having me here. I am uh, so excited and I see there's a lot of other people that are very excited um, about um, user experience in the cockpit. Um, it's a very, very exciting uh, topic. I really love it. Um, working with Honeywell gave me the opportunity to work in a lot of projects, but the project that I'm focusing on uh, that I want to talk to you about is my first project in aerospace that is an autopilot because it was like a, it, it was the gateway uh, project for me to get in really crazy into aerospace stuff. So well, ev how everything started, I uh, was a graphic designer. I, I went to college to study for graphic design because there was no video games in my, in, in, I went in Mexico to college. Um, so I went to graphic design. I was very interested in web design. It was just starting. Um, some of the younger kids will not remember Flash, but uh, that's what I started doing. So I was doing websites. It was really exciting because I got like a very important jobs at the beginning because there were no grown-ups that did websites. It was all the kids. So it, it was really uh, it was really nice. But after a couple of years doing uh, websites, I finished my degree. They were like, okay, this is kind of boring. I um, I was living in a city, kind of five hours from Mexico City. I moved it back to Mexico City um, and I started doing uh, e-commerce for Latin America and it was very interesting that's my first encounter with UX because um, what we were doing back then it was just copying whatever uh, they were doing in the US we will copy it just translate it in Spanish and try to make it work with the with the people there but the economies are different people use their uh, they don't have credit cards, they use debit cards more. So it was a different thing. So that's when I was encountered with user experience, like, okay, so it's not just the design part, like we cannot just translate things directly. We also have to translate things culturally. So I did a little bit of advertising for some years. I want to see how was the glamorous life of the, the advertising. Uh, I didn't like it. Um, so I went back to uh, working with apps and uh, still working on e-commerce and this kind of stuff. And uh, I was in a point in my career that I was like, I'm kind of like, what is next? Like, uh, I would like advertising is not my thing. I really like to do digital content. Uh, and I really like the, the format in the phones and all this stuff. So uh, I had an opportunity with, uh, with Honeywell, with aerospace doing mostly phones. Like I was doing uh, all the stuff that was for phone applications to communicate uh, with your uh, internet aboard of a your phone, um, apps to use your internet in the cockpit to be able to make phone calls, but everything was centered about the phone where like user stuff. Uh, but then um, there was this opportunity that no one wanted to move to Albuquerque, New Mexico to work in an autopilot. And I was like, oh, wait, 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 wait. This is like real aerospace stuff. Like this is the stuff that is in an airplane, not an an app that goes in the phone. So I raised my hand and said, like, I want to do it. I will, I will learn about it. I will learn to do it. And they told me, okay, yes, but you need to go to ground school because pilots are ruthless and they are going to eat you whole if you don't know what you're talking about. So I'm like, okay, I will go to ground school. That is basically where they teach you all the fundamentals of weather and all these things and how the instruments work. And I was like, okay, I will go, I will do it. I went to ground school. I grabbed my dog, my bike, and I moved it. Uh, I was living in the basically California, the in Mexico, but at the same level as California, and I moved it to New Mexico. So um, it was a very exciting thing. And um, first of all, what it is uh, and what does it does an autopilot? So these are the autopilots that uh, were traditional autopilots, basically they um, keep a direction, they follow instructions, the most basic ones just keep a direction and an altitude and can do some other functions depending on how advanced are, but you basically need to know what you are doing. That was the, that was the thing, like uh, one of the important things uh, that you can see here is the altitude button. That is the, how high is your airplane from the ground and um, heading is where it's, your airplane pointing off. And you have another other uh, other functions. Uh, one of them is like a level that you cannot see in this one uh, that basically holds your airplane. It will level it. So you have like some time to think if something is, is happening. 
But all of these are very complicated and when you see them, you don't understand what's going on. It's not very user friendly. And the other thing is like when they, they bring me to the, uh, to the airplane side, it's like you are going to work in general aviation. These are the small airplanes, the airplanes that people have for fun to go to their own thing. Like uh, they learn it to fly uh, for fun. They have a small airplane. And some of them have instrument rating, which means um, you have an autopilot and you can fly without seeing where you're flying. And that's where you need an autopilot. Like you need to know where you're going. And if you cannot see, you know with your instruments where you are without having to look through the window, which basically means you can uh, fly in, in that night in different weather conditions. The thing is a lot of people in this sector that have these airplanes that have the autopilot and they have instruments, they don't use it that often. They have it because it's nice to have, but they don't fly every other day at night. And as everything that you don't do all the time, you start forgetting. You still have to keep certain amount of hours to be able to keep flying and maintain your license as a pilot, as a general aviation pilot. But there are some challenges on safety. So that was uh, the, the thing that um, the business was worried. It's like, let's create an autopilot that is easier to use for the people that don't use it that often, but they still need it. When after a certain time are like, oh, how I did this. And one of the problems basically is that the autopilot right there doesn't tell you what it's doing. You need to press the button and tell the instruction of what it's going to do, input information, and it will do it, but you have to remember it, which is a problem, uh, especially, um, let me go to the next one. Ah, well, this was the one that I'm telling you about. So uh, yeah, we wanted to reduce the workload for the pilots because they don't use it that often, uh, provide situational awareness. It's like, what is doing now? If I get distracted by some other thing, uh, what is happening in, what is the last thing I told my autopilot to do? And one other thing that was very attractive for the market is they wanted to update the cockpit, make it more modern with minimal modifications. And this part of Honeywell has like all the connections for the, basically it was a plug and play. It was almost like those um, radios. I, I'm going to reveal my age with this thing, but I don't know if you remember some time long ago, you could take your stereo out of the car <laughs> and then put it back. Yes, it's just like they call it the plug and play. Well, that was kind of the concept of this autopilot. You could rip your old autopilot and put a really nice shiny uh, touch screen into it with minimal modification, like a car. <laughs> um, so um, some of the constraints that we had around this, and let me, I'm going to try to move you all ladies to the other side. There we go. Oh, there. It's just I had everybody in this side of the screen. Uh, so one of the constraints we had is that most of our users were 60 year old and plus because uh, millennials cannot afford their planes. So basically the people that have airplanes are a little bit in the older age. Um, the FAA has a lot, that is the Federal Aviation Administration has a lot of rules and recommendations are open to interpretation. So they know exactly they have had so many studies, so much knowledge on how to make mechanical and, and physical controls. They tell you how big your buttons need to be, how much space you have to have for fingers to go around it, even how much pressure they need to be activated with. But on all this stuff that is digital, they don't have rules, they have recommendations. And when you create a project uh, that you want to certify so you can fly with it, you have to go and tell them hey, can you approve it? And they send a person and this person evaluates according to their perceptions. So it's very important to have the documentation to prove if you disagree with this person in, in certain points, if she tells you this font is too small, you cannot read it and you have to change it. You have to have the information to tell him, hey, no, I, I know that this is your perception, but here are my studies with 30 people that we tested and they were using glasses and they were these ages and they can read it. So you can, uh, so it stops being a perception thing. So this is when I faced ergonomics and human factors, the thing that I had six months of in college and never touched it again until I was back 
in, in a situation where we really need it. And this is a uh, thing that could uh, solve most of our problems. These are uh, a couple of pages of a really uh, good book. I have the name here. Again, I have to move you guys. Whoop. So um, I will add the name in the chat of this book. Um, it basically has all the all the measurements you need, how far away from your face you can still read, uh, if you obviously have like a, a good uh, view, but also um, you have to account for people are big and small, right? So a big person will have like a less distance between them and the instrument or a small person will have to reach out and it will change their point of view. And to make it even more fun, um, it's not like all the airplanes are the same. So we had to take considerations for different sizes of uh, different positions. Some people will have it in the top, other people will have it in the bottom, other people will have them in front to the side directly from them. So we have to test all these uh, different positions with fonts and we settle in uh, three different font sizes uh, for it. And the other thing that we had to consider and I actually never thought about this a lot until I was confronted with it in the autopilot. We have a very limited space. Um, is that I have very small hands. I have very small fingers. I can click anything in my phone, no matter how small it is. But the um, physical um, the physical dimensions that FAA gave us is half an inch per button. It was like your buttons need and they need to be because they are considering what is the 99 and the 1% person percentile meant that it's like very big hands. And it's a thing we had the opportunity to try with a lot of pilots. They will come and they will try some of our initial ideas. They could not touch it because it was so small that they, especially if you consider that this is an environment that you are moving and I mean, it's aerospace. We had very awesome opportunities to go and test it flying, but we also spent a lot of time in a hot car in the sun in a parking lot while people shake it to simulate the movement. <laughs> I mean, eventually we went. To, eventually, we tried it in a real uh, in a real location, but sometimes it was you need to test something really quick. It was like a TV in a car, oh my whilst God. people moved it. So we could like, hey, can you touch it if you're moving it? Because it's it's different. It's an environment that is moving, that there is noise, that there is, uh, that there is movement, that there is like, a, if you are scared, if you're in a situation that your life is in danger, are you going to be able to touch this? So we have to do a lot of these, um, a, a lot of these uh, tests, which it was very fun. This is one of the, one of the things that we did for considering, uh, for, uh, for, making sure it was going to work. So um, we had some problems with procuring a nice screen for it because when you are going to do autopilots, you are going to do probably less than 10,000. And for companies that make screens, that's nothing. Like it's nothing like order me a million pieces and I will see if I do something custom for you. So we ended with this RGB screen that was 70 pixels tall for 240 pixels wide. And it was about an inch and a half for I think uh, six inches, which is ridiculously small. And then we have to confront another realities of it that the fact that the font could be smaller, yes, but we didn't have enough pixels to render it good. So we were doubly limited by what the FAA can read and what are display can uh, can show. So uh, obviously you cannot test that in your computer because if you have a Mac, you have amazing, shiny, beautiful uh, screens and you don't have like uh, this graininess that we needed. So um, I have an amazing product owner and he went on internet and found a TV, a TV made in Taiwan that had exactly the trashiest quality of 70 pixels per inch that we needed. So here we did, um, we had the, the physical um, carcass of it because we also have uh, industrial designers helping doing all the outside and we will put it on top to see how it worked on that screen. 
because that way we could simulate the real how it was going to look really because i will show you some of the um some of the stuff here is like i have a little bit of video you can see we were seeing how the how the buttons work it so this is kind of the evolution of the project um how it started and how it ended the here in the left is the, the thing I confronted when I uh, arrived to the project. Um, the engineers had like a very, very ambitious ideas. They wanted uh, to have natural language in the top that it will be telling you what you had to do or what you were doing. We have this uh, thing that says straight and level in the corner that uh, we will eventually uh, change to a single button in the corner that um, this is the thing that levels your airplane in, in the case of uh, in, in the case that you're having an emergency you don't know what you're doing you press that one and everything goes like hopefully safe and still so we went through a lot of iterations trying to find the right thing and uh, and you can see how at some point we were even considering some really nice textures uh, because that's a thing that uh, in aerospace uh, works really good with uh, with people. I don't. I'm never sure if it's because of the age of the uh, of the market or it is because it's like really easier to see. But making buttons look like three D buttons doing the skeuomorphic thing really improved the results on accuracy for a touch. So at some point we were planning to do this, uh, but our screen was not as good. So we could not have like a really nice rendered image and well, you could have like some 3D stuff. So we had to go with a very clean look. So these lines that you're seeing were actually one pixel wide. Most of it were like, all those lines were one pixel wide because again, it was a very grainy screen, but it was a lot of fun. There is a lot of uh, inventiveness. So this is one of the user tests that we did. Because to this point in the project, everybody was very skeptic because there is the factor that they, a lot of pilots say they can just stretch their hand and they don't have to look to their autopilot to adjust it because the buttons feel different and they know where the knob is and they can do it without looking. But we were working with um, general aviation pilots that sometimes have difficult with this. So we were like, okay, okay let's do a test. So this is our test setup. Um, so the first thing they did, and you can, um, I think you can probably not see it there, but we had two settings. We had one with the autopilot. This was like actually the one of the tests, the first test the screens we got. Uh, and but they will first do. Um, there's these things in uh, in aviation. They are called approach. So when you're going to a um, airport, you don't get like, you don't get to fly wherever you, way you want. There is like a line and you have to follow the line and there's a step one, two, three, and you get instructions from the control tower. So we got uh, two sets with the same difficulty, but different things. And the first time the pilots will try with their autopilot, they were used to. So we will give them instructions in real time and they will try to keep up. And most of them did it really good. They, they, uh, fine, but there were like some mishaps. They have to rearrange a couple of things. They uh, obviously the test was kind of in in that vein to like they had to remember a lot of information. So they they used that one, and actually our chief of engineers he was very skeptic. He didn't like the idea of the touch screen. He was very diligent. He is one of my close friends now, and. He was like, I don't like this. I don't think it's going to be good. And he designed the test to try to cancel the project. <laughs> so it was, it was awesome. I was like, it's fine. Let's see if it works. So, but he did it. I feel like he did it trying to like, they are not going to, there's not going to be a difference. They're going to have trouble, but actually it was amazing because um, then we try with the touch um, autopilot and they perform 60% better everything they are being faster they're being more accurate they are not missing instructions they don't have to remember that much wow. three hours later in three hours uh our chief engineer had changed his team. he was in love with the project he was like i cannot believe this is that good we could see in person how 
all this stuff that we have been doing in theory. And he was a big part of, of helping choosing the font size and all this stuff, but he was a skeptic, but it worked. And I think that's one of the most exciting moments of my aerospace career that we were like, okay, we changed their mind. And a lot of them even like, uh, they were like not super confident after they have when they when we asked them, hey, how do you think you did with the, the, the touch uh, pilot? They were like, I don't know. Like, I don't feel like it's, I, I feel like I did better with the other one, with the physical one. I was like, yeah, you didn't. You didn't. Like you were better with the other one. And it, like some people were like, really? But other people were like, when can I buy this for my airplane? Which is very exciting. That's a, that's a thing you want to you want to hear uh, when when you're testing something. This is the final product. Um, it's now in the website, they are selling it. Uh, we had a patent for it. Uh, it was uh, very, very exciting to have it uh, finish. Uh, I think it's one of, one of the uh, things that um, make me uh, love aerospace so much because I worked with a great team. We had an industrial designer in the team, uh, we have um, uh, uh, this engineer. He's he's amazing. His name is Santosh, and he does crazy things. We were his pet project because he does like things that uh, you can fly an airplane with your brain. Like you just put a helmet and it reads your mind. And he does crazy stuff, but he humor us in doing the autopilot. And and it became uh, something that uh, we really enjoyed doing. I learned a lot of how airplanes work. One of the things that it still uh, blows my mind to this day um, is that uh, when I was learning about uh, how to read air charts and all this stuff is that I discovered if you want to go north, you cannot go in a straight line. You actually have to deviate a little bit because the earth people is round. <laughs> so if you just go up you don't, and the earth is moving, you don't go where you think you're going. You have to adjust for that. And it's a thing that is, so obvious now for me but the first time i learned it i was like of course this is crazy stuff is not where you think it is that's uh Aww. that's a very uh that that's a very thing that a uh, very interesting thing that aerospace teaches me like things are are there but sometimes you think you can get to them in one way but it's not you have to deviate a little bit and um there were a lot of other projects I did after this one. Uh, one of them was um, weather. I worked a lot uh, with weather and a lot of the lessons that uh, I learned with the autopilot, like how big you have to make your buttons, how good your touch areas have to be, how to give more allowances for big hands or for, um, Oh, you have to have a glare. Um, I have a, a video, it's just like a little bit uh, too loud where I had uh, one of my coworkers outside with a reflector trying to get the light to come through the windshield of the airplane so we could see the effects of it on, on the screen. Um, so we could design better readability even when you are in conditions that you have a lot of light has made me change my approach even for phones because now I think, huh, is this button way too small? Like I don't have a regulation that tells me uh, I have to go half an inch, but will someone with bigger fingers will be able to use it? And I feel like that's also a very good consideration for another cases of usability, especially um, if you are trying to make everybody of all the different kinds of bodies be able to use something. Uh, another project I did for, it's the AeroView touch that is basically the whole, this is like the whole thing, the whole cockpit uh, where you can see your maps and you can see um, all the instruments that is going. Uh, this project um, had a best design award from the uh, Design Institute of Chicago. And uh, it was also a very exciting thing, but honestly, I think there was, for me, there was nothing as exciting as that first autopilot because it was where I learned most of the stuff uh, in aerospace. And I went back to saying like, okay, yeah, we also have a physical body that needs to accommodate for a lot of stuff when we are using, um, when we are using things and it, it, it's like not everything is virtual we need to account for 
for differences. And it was very funny because the first time I got into an airplane, um, my feet don't get to the pedals. I'm too short. <laughs> So I had to push the seat all the way front to be able to be like in, in the range. And then I realized that there was like whoever, this airplane obviously was not mine, uh, but now I had a lot of instruments that I had to turn my head all the way up because I could not see it because I was too forward. <laughs> I was feeling like one of these persons that drive their cars like this. It also happens in airplanes. And that was kind of, um, some of the stuff. I was planning to do this in 40 minutes. I have 20 minutes of uh, questions, but I speak very fast. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's whenever you want. We do have some questions. Yes, I would love to answer them. Well, first of all, um, take yourself off mute and let's give Div like a round of applause. Woo! Thank you. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Wow, that was so cool. I, I love that you just kind of walked us through like a case study and like along the way, ah, like I have, I have a ton of questions, but I'm not gonna hog the spotlight. Um, we do have some questions that popped up during. So I'll kind of like pick out some of the ones that popped up during the chat. You did look? Yes. Thank you so much for such a great presentation. Hey. Uh, so one of our members, Katie uh, Brickton, Rapton, sorry. <laughs> um, were you limited to that screen size because of the requirement to plug and play into the existing area into the cockpit? Like why that size? So we were limited because we wanted to use the space that it was already uh, made in airplanes. So we wanted to re retrofit other, that, uh, other kinds of um, um, autopilots because it's really expensive to make ho new holds in an airplane. So that was part of reducing the cost because general aviation is like a cheaper market. It's like not private planes, it's more like grandpa did this with his retirement. So <laughs> they kind of spent around between uh, 5,000 to 20,000 to do an operate in their airplane. And it's probably the, all, the, the, all the money they are going to spend that year in their airplane. So it was important to keep the cost down. and that was the, the cheapest option and the option we could get, that screen. Got it. All right, so R. Jaeger had a, um, a lot of really great questions and he is a Boeing engineer. Oh my God, he's going to put me in the spot. <laughs> no, the, the, the <laughs> questions are bad. Um, so uh, he was wondering if there was any tactile feedback um, on the touch screen. We didn't have money for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's That's a, uh, we explore it with other, um, there is this technology that I have seen um, in experiments right now. It's like not, again, if I had unlimited amount of money to make my own airplane with my own uh, cockpit, there is um, this glass that they are designing that gives you haptic feedback and it has texture. Wow. And it can change, it can change the feedback from one area to the other, that's an option that in theory I wanted to explore, but there were no monies for that. I would have loved it to have uh, some, some haptic feedback from that. Interesting, okay. And um, uh, same user, uh, R. Jaeger also asked, uh, Diblik, I'm leading a project team, working on a product that will need multiple UIs designed for, for several customer groups. Um, it has the chance to be, oh my God. All right, I see where this is coming. It has the chance to be a first in human history. Uh, are you available and interested? <laughs> <laughs> are any of my coworkers in here? <laughs> you know what? We'll take it offline. All right, Manaj, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Manaj, uh, says, that should be a folded, that should be a folded note. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering this too, um, Manoj, I'm so sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Um, how, how were your deadlines on this product? What was the actual time frame? So aerospace is very generous uh, with time. I think we developed this in the course of 18 months, but I, had, um, I have a couple of uh, very pressing uh, timelines because um, I was pregnant when I was doing the finish of this project. 
So I needed to finish before I went into maternity leave. So that was the most pressing uh, thing I was doing <laughs> with the time. And we also have an engineer retiring. But in general, um, we tried it. We were working in parallel. The engineers were uh, working on having all the retrofit uh, and all the technical uh, side ready. And I will say that we were working in the sprints. Like I would say we'd take a month for a sprint and we were um, focusing on one function at a time. So we were doing iterations. I will say we had different iteration almost every four months. So yeah, it took us like probably 18 months to get to the point that we were like ready to execute the final version. But I also entered the project when they already had our requirement documents. I think that requirement document was in the back burner for probably a year. So it, it moves so slow, especially yeah. because you have to certify. So yeah, that's, that's always so slow and scary. Uh, I see Daniela has her hand raised. Daniela, you wanna go ahead and ask a question? Yeah, hi, thank you for the presentation. It was quite interesting actually. But um, my question is more related with, how did you manage uh, work in an environment that it's, um, I mean, yeah, I think there's- Very I, hostile I, and male yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, you put it <laughs> in nice words, I suppose. Yeah, how did you manage and actually I, I can only, I don't know, imagine this uh, guy who was your friend, he, almost your enemy <laughs> trying to, you know. To yeah, it, it was very interesting because I will say that pilots uh, tend to have a certain level of arrogance that you need, definitely. If you are going to put your life and some other people's life in a tube of metal shooting through the sky, you have to believe you are the hottest thing around, oh. for sure. Like uh, it's a personality, it's a personality trait. Uh, like uh, you need it uh, but um, I think uh, one of the things that always helps me in these situations is uh, to be very open and be very willing to learn and I was always approaching them with I am not a pilot I am trying to learn as much as I can so we can understand each other uh, but you are the pilot and I want to hear what you have to say and I have a couple of instances where um, especially with some old school uh, engineers that were used to having like a little bit more of a raising their voice and being uh, trying to be kind of, of mean uh, on that situation. I am very fortunate to be an immigrant and having English not as my first language. So I will play the card of like, are you angry? <laughs> Why are you angry? Did I offend you? Did I say something that is like making you angry? Because I'm trying to understand you. And if you scream at me or you get angry, I cannot understand you. Oh, interesting. And, and that usually, it, it, it will reframe because when they are, I guess they are not used to being calling out when they are being rude. Oh. Wow. But that helped me a lot. Something that maybe a lot of the women in this group can relate to. Like, yeah, that's a really interesting tactic to try to like disarm because it kind of makes that person check themselves, right? Yeah, like, because they will not tell me, yes, I am angry. They will say like, oh, no, no, no. Like, no, it's like, I'm trying to explain this. And it will always have that result. It will like, oh, no, like I'm trying to explain this. or uh, And I feel that also uh, there is this communication the skills that were coming from a a company that was like heavy engineering that uh, they were not they are used to be genius because some of them are completely brilliant and geniuses uh, but they are not that good communicating so I at some point my my labor as a user experience designer was also to facilitate the communication between the team members so we could have like an easier way to work but I always love to call people when they are being rude I'm like hey I don't work with people that scream at me. Oh, that's great. Uh, thanks for that. I, I think a lot of people here can apply that. Um, so our next question is from Sherpa Gupta. Um, she asks, uh, how quickly did you complete ground school and how did you finance it? Honeywell paid for it. Honeywell paid for it. Uh, and they also have a program too for um, learning to be a pilot. 
that I could not get in because I didn't have a green card at the time and you need to, mm. you need to hoop to, to many um, hoops to do that. But um, they pay for it. It took me 15 days. It was two weeks, but I was there from eight in the morning to uh, eight in the morning to probably six in the afternoon. So it was all day uh, thing. And I got uh, the books, uh, but honestly, um, there is a lot of videos on YouTube. If you want to do ground school, uh, you can go and see the videos on YouTube and you are going to learn a lot. And it has the advantage that you can pause the teacher and go get the sandwich and come back and rehear the stuff that they say previously. Uh, sometimes when I don't remember something uh, that I need, uh, especially weather, because weather is so freaking complicated. I uh, I go and search for a video that explains it in the internet. It's amazing. Wait, yeah. can you elaborate on that? You said weather is complicated. Uh, yeah, so um, one of the things that you need to fly an airplane is to be super aware of the weather, especially uh, small airplanes. So there is a lot of factors. And um, later I went to do work in a in a software that is only for weather visualization and how, which route are you going to follow? And there's so much information to learn about how the weather works, how the hot uh, air goes where and the cold weather. And after you get into aerospace, you become a weather freak. Yeah. Like, and now I have a radar app in my phone when it's raining, I don't I'm like, oh, it's how it is going to be. So all that affects a lot of flight, especially general aviation that was where I was more focused. So I uh, had to learn a lot about it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because, um, so I used to work with Diblik, uh, not on the same project, unfortunately, but um, I have worked on like, uh, like aerospace uh, stuff related to aviation. Um, and it's interesting how like it is very helpful to know how these parts and like the the effects of like conditions like weather and, and things like that. Like uh, for example, my soft my uh, design was for a software piece of software that helps diagnose engine issues. And I it, this project completely overwhelmed me until I learned about the physics of an engine. Somehow, mm -hmm. like once I put that together, like the real world. Uh, Sophia, you'll love this the real world object of like the engine, the rest of the software stuff came to me rather simply, you know, it was, it was kind of, it kind of all fell into place. Uh, so look, I know, um, I know you didn't share this project in particular, but one of the things um, I wanted to ask about was um, like, there are some other, uh, I remember the thing that made me want to invite you as a speaker was there were some of those tablet designs uh, that you had to do that are going to be used in the cockpit. I remember seeing gray text on the gray background. I was like, why, why is it gray on gray? And this oh, is what yeah. like started your whole <laughs> Yes. And can you speak a little bit about why you had gray text on gray background? Yes, uh, so um, you cannot have uh, a white background uh, because uh, it's when you are in a cockpit that you have very low light, it, you need to be able to see outside of the airplane what is happening. A lot of the work of a pilot is checking there's nothing else in this way. You will not believe, but there's a lot of traffic up there. So they have to be constantly scanning. But if you look down and you see in your tablet and you have an iPad or a phone and it's very bright, that's going to damage uh, your, your, it's like when you go uh, to the bathroom at night and turn on the lights and then you're like all these, it's going to happen the same thing and you are going to uh, lose the ability to, to see what is happening outside. So gray on gray uh, works way better on low, uh, and low amounts of light. And it also, uh, in, in daylight, when you have the sun shining on it, it also makes a good contrast uh, to be able to read it. And there's a lot of, uh, of those things um, that we are always testing. I remember, uh, I don't know if you were there, Havana. There was one day we were testing precisely this and I, we have a small bedroom that we can turn off the light in the office and it's the only place where it's really dark. 
So I will drag two, we are the weird, like aerospace is always the weirdest of the office because I will drag two or three people to test in a dark back room, turn off the light, get two people in and close the door oh. so, they can, so they can see if they can read it. And if it is not like hurting too much to your eyes, but we were like, if you ever wonder why there were three of us going into the bathroom, <laughs> locking the door and turning off the light, it was because of that. That is so funny. And um, I remember one of the times, like, you know how at stand up, they ask you for blockers. I think at one point your blocker was, this, there's clouds in the sky. You can't test in the sun. Yes. I cannot test direct sunlight because we didn't have direct sunlight and being in Atlanta, that's an issue that doesn't solve in a week or two in rainy season. Mm. It's not a problem in Phoenix, funnily enough. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so I have another question from Sherpa Gupta. No, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, Manoj, uh, your, what are your favorite design tools? Oh, man. I'm, um, I became a fan of a sketch. I was not a fan of Sketch when I started. Now I am, I think it's uh, very easy to use. Uh, I think it's very quick. I think uh, it gives me so many options. Uh, uh, in, uh, in aerospace, I don't know why we have like so many screens sometimes that the fact that I can have uh, icons that uh, become symbols and I can reuse them and just go and change them. I really love that about uh, Sketch. The other thing I love uh, and Havana knows this, is Zeppelin. I will fight with every director or manager I have had, so they pay Zeppelin. Some point I was paying for it myself because um, I feel like giving the more detail you give to your development team, uh, the better it is. Um, at some point, someone called me the pixel police because I will take uh, the design printed and print my design and hold them to the window to make sure they were pixel perfect. Oh my <laughs> and it, <laughs> I'm, I know I'm, I'm crazy about pixels, but um, it was not a big, probably it's not a big deal on iPads uh, or, or phones sometimes, but when you have a custom device and when you have like a limited amount of space, a deviation or one or two pixels can throw the whole thing off. So I, I, I was like, okay, so this is one pixel wide and this is two pixels wide. And uh, Zeppelin lets me do that very, very easily. Yeah. So I will say those are my uh, two favorite tools, but also I really love to sketch my things by hand. Yeah, I can see that. And there is another thing that I do uh, that if we have done this in person, I will have bring printed. I usually print my uh, mockups in white paper and get a one of these, I have one of these, an ink pad, and get people to get their fingers with ink and try to touch something in a prototype made of paper. Oh. Because, uh, yeah, fingers don't lie. So that way you can see where the stuff is, uh, where the stuff is landing. And come on, we're grownups. Who doesn't love to uh, ditch the office for one day and play uh, paint with your yeah. fingers? That's so really, cool. It's fun and it really helps you see where fingers are landing because it's very complicated sometimes to film or something. Mm -hmm. And it, it helped that ex kind of exercise helps me a lot, especially with people that have big fingers, they don't use their whole finger. Really? They use like, they use like the edge of their finger or the top of their fingers. So that uh, it's, a, it's a thing I, uh, I notice about people. So it's, it's very interesting. I recommend using uh, real tools. Um, and we do have a couple of questions from uh, John. Uh, thank you for asking questions. Uh, one of the questions is, can you describe um, experiences within your case study with A-B testing and continuing uh, iterations? How did you know when enough was enough? Uh, because we ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar. Yeah, I mean, I, um, there's always uh, room for improvement, even after we, we feel like uh, some stuff was completely done. I feel there's always room for improvement. And that's another thing that I think makes digital devices so attractive is that I can release an update for your autopilot or for your cockpit 
that you don't have to come to the shop for more than five minutes, that we can update the software and add extra functionality, or if we detect with usage and time and feedback from the customers, we detect that something could be improved, we can improve it. So I feel like even after you release a product, especially digital ones, you can still improve and that adds more value to any product. That's true, yeah. Um, John had another question. Uh, is there anything you would have done differently in the design process uh, with the benefit of hindsight? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, definitely I will have uh, not a starting uh, the design process until we had the definite um, um, quality of the screen. Because we have started designing uh, with the sight of getting a um, higher quality screen and we had to walk back to make it simpler. And we lost a lot of time going from a, from a really nice uh, screen that we were thinking is going to have like almost iPhone quality to welcome this is Pac-Man. Yeah. So yeah, I will have I will have definitely uh, say that uh, we should have stopped to do that. Also, there is this thing that we like to do that is starting to code before we have the design because we think we're saving time. Most of the time, we are not. Interesting. But I feel like uh, sometimes like you should the the design and the mockup should be a little bit ahead than starting the the code because we have certainly to to go back. And, and redo some stuff. That is great advice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank You're you. welcome. Uh, I have some questions. Um, Go ahead. I'm wondering, um, first of all, do you know anything about virtual reality? Have you researched? Yes. So how we does- We had a simulator. <laughs> and human factors play into that? Because when you were like showing the testing stuff, I'm like, I wonder like, in a virtual reality, it's not real, but you are still designing for a space, right? Yes, so we actually, um, our incredible industrial uh, designer, um, he uh, figured out how to put our stuff in a virtual, uh, in, in an RV. So we had the autopilot and the other thing, oh, like I'm you could not use them, but you could see them. And we like this simulator and we could see them. And it was very cool because we can check some stuff. And uh, at that point, uh, like the technology was not that advanced that we can actually simulate on it, but we can show it to customers, how it will look and how it will kind of feel. And uh, that was really, really useful. I will really love to see an environment and like if I had my ideal like all the money in the world, like Elon Musk decides he needs to give me a couple of billions of dollars <laughs> so I can play with airplanes. Um, I will um, definitely do uh, like a, a, a place where you will have someone dedicated to do VR just so you don't have to drive all the way to the hangar oh, to wow. unscrew some stuff, put it in just to test the stuff and see how it feels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but I mean, I need to. I, I I need to. I don't know. Kidnap Elon Musk <laughs> to get that kind of money. So I don't know if this is true, but maybe Diblik, Susan, and um, our Jaeger here can help me. But like, is it okay? So I heard this story about like uh, when they were trying to design the ergonomics, of, uh, like of the seat in the cockpit. Mm -hmm. um, at first, they were trying to design for the average man, but because they were trying to design for the average man, it actually fit nobody. <laughs> because how many people are the average size, whatever that means, right? Um, so I was wondering, is that true? And then number two, uh, how do you like? How do you balance? I get okay. How do I ask my question? One of the things that I've tried to start designing for is edge cases, because I find that like if you design for the edge cases, it's going to work for most people. Take subtitles for TV and movies, for example. Originally it was for uh, like hard of hearing and deaf people, but it's helped like ESL speakers, um, other people like people like it's helped so many more people than mm -hmm. the audience. So 
what are your thoughts about like designing for the average majority user versus like edge cases? So I, I think that's important. If edge cases can be accommodated, everybody can use it. Uh, so if you have something that a very short person can reach, but a very tall person is also comfortable with, it's going to be, it's going to be good. The advantage we have in aerospace, and eh, I'm going to say advantage, is that um, every pilot has to pass a physical exam. So you have to be fit to fly an airplane. And that's very relative because I feel like a lot of accommodations could be made for people that are not fit to yeah. do. I even know some cases, uh, there's one thing that we uh, do is that you're not supposed to play an airplane if you are daltonic, if you cannot see colors because that's a big deal. But even though we accommodate for that, like uh, we still have an indication and FAA recommends to have an indication that is not only change of color when something is active or not. So that's why some of the stuff you see has a notch under it when it's active. It's because that way uh, they can tell even if they cannot see it's green, which it will be a terrible inconvenience. But uh, honestly, I know a designer, uh, this is crazy. I have one of my teachers in college, he could not see color and he was a designer, a graphic designer. He could only see yeah. yellows and red. Like that. And he was a designer and he learned how to design by uh, the color theory by numbers. Oh. And that's how he will pick his colors. And most of the time, 90% of the time, they were great. So I feel like there's always like, you cannot count that there's not going to be a blind color designer. There are. Yeah. And no, if that's not the most fringe case there is, I don't know. Ari Yeager has a, his hand raised. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Havana. Can you hear me? Yes. We can yes. Hear Outstanding. Um, First of all, please understand that everything that Diblik is telling you is not only 100% true, but this is information that is very hard to find for anybody who is not in the industry. She's speaking from first person experience, which is not what you learn in school. Uh, so please understand the value of the gift that she's providing by actually telling her story. It actually is very important. Um, with respect to the details that you are asking her about colors and size and things like that, consider, um, and this is actually something that I would appreciate if Ibli would comment about, because she probably knows more about this than I do. Um, look at history, right? The first airplanes were only about 100 years ago. They were controlled with a couple of very simple mechanical controls. Some of them had no instruments. Yet in an airplane with, what, three instruments? Uh, Lindbergh was the first to fly solo across the Atlantic. Yeah. Okay. Today, we have what are in, in the business, uh, what are called glass cockpits, which for each person at the pointy end of the airplane, uh, normally two people. And there's a reason for that. Why you want to, you do not want one. It's actually important. Each one of those people has at least three screens. Some of them have twice that number. Okay. And maybe for each human at the pointy end of the airplane, there are over 100 mechanical controls talking about the possibility of a workload which under ideal conditions as we're sitting here drinking martinis with nothing happening is no problem but if the smallest thing goes wrong 500 people will die badly if you make one mistake right. that's that's why they hired you and that's why you do not want children or idiots at the pointy end of the airplane. Okay, you want an adult who actually knows what they're doing. <laughs> yes, yes, <Okay>. very definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ari Yeager. And uh, you had great questions. Thank you so much. And awesome. you, you know what? There is a, this piece of technology that I just realized that some cars have. Um, 
I was watching a, a documentary about airplanes and how, um, so every airplane flies a slightly different, you know, like a, a, you pull a little bit more or you push a little bit more, it takes the, the turns a little bit more sharp or not. Uh, so you have to learn, you have to be certified to fly every single kind of airplane that you fly. And um, then I was learning um, that uh, at some point they created this computer that makes uh, flight the same. So from one model to another model of airplane, it will feel the same to you, but this computer will buffer the stuff that is happening to, so the airplane, yes, so the airplane does the thing that you want to do. So you can fly, let's say two kinds of airplanes feel the same when you're driving them, while flying them, but they are not actually the same. The computer is adjusting your expectations to the reality. And this technology, it's in every single car right now. Like all the modern cars have the same thing. That is like, uh, because some people think they drive really good, but they are not driving really good. It's really the computer in their car that was first tested in an airplane that is keeping the car stable and controlling this shagging of the, uh, of the wheel that they are doing, yeah. So there's a lot of technology that is first created in airplanes that then uh, trickles down. I mean, autopilots, the cruise control of your car is basically an autopilot. Oh. So I think it, it's, it's very interesting. A lot of stuff has been pioneered uh, by pilots and oh. by the aerospace industry. And then it goes to everywhere. That's amazing. Yeah. And we are at the hour. Um, and if you have to drop, that's fine. Um, let's just put in one more question. If you guys are fine. If you guys need yes. to stop, Diblick, uh, I just uh, dropped Diblick's LinkedIn profile in the chat. Yes. Please connect with her and ask her any other questions that you have that pop up. Um, does, does anyone have any other questions? I do have one, but I don't want to, um, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve myself. Send me pictures of your pets. I always appreciate those. <laughs> well, if no one else has any other questions, I'll just end with a question from my own. I don't see anyone raising their hand. All right, so converting skeptics. You said that one of the users was just very skeptical of what you were doing. Yeah. I think that is something all of us can probably um, relate to in their careers. How did, like, what are, what's your, advice for converting those skeptics or um, like helping them overcome their existing biases? Like what, what are your thoughts on that advice for everyone else? So I feel like every person that um, like the, the, smarter per, the smarter people are always willing to change their opinion based on facts. And if you cannot make someone change their opinion based on facts, you're wasting your time with them. Uh, so the easiest way to, to show facts uh, is testing. Uh, when the person is involved in the testing uh, and they see it with their own eyes and they see the improvement when a, a third party is using it, I think that's a very powerful tool to change the, the mind of another person. Even, even your own, like uh, I, I say this case with, with this engineer, but uh, honestly, there has been stuff that I'm like, as a designer, I think it looks ugly. I was not super fan. I use this gray bluish it's always like people are always like, why are you using that color? I used not to love it, uh, but is the best color for read for reading with it. It works good in dark. It works good in light. It's not, it's my favorite color. No, I will probably not wear a dress of that color, <laughs> but it's, it is very easy to see and it, it performs better. So um, sometimes as a designer, and I, I, I love things to be very neat and aesthetic. Sometimes I have to, to give up those ideals because I know uh, something that I consider objectively ugly will yeah. perform better. And sometimes that's, that's the thing. Sometimes we are doing something just for the aesthetics and it needs to look really fancy. But uh, in aerospace, uh, we don't have that luxury very often. So it needs to look, uh, it needs to work. So uh, the same thing, everybody hates eschewmorphic buttons and this, you know, this velvet and embossed kind of thing that you will use to do with Microsoft Word when you make uh, stuff kind of bulge. But 
it works awesome. Users love it and they have so much accuracy that sometimes it's worth using. No, that's a great insight. Um, I found that in aerospace too. I, you know, like one of the design principles is to subtract, subtract. There's a lot of emphasis on minimalism, for example. Yeah. I found that when I was designing for that space, if anything, the engineers wanted more data. On, yeah. Like, like on the it, oh, you know what? Uh, like uh, in my head, I'm like, <laughs> wow, it's so cluttered. But the users actually wanted more data. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to like in certain situations. Yes, there are design best practices and design principles. Yeah. But if the user, if that's not useful, the user. Yeah. Like, also, the 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 thing that the, a button needs to look like a button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially when you are desperately looking for one. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. Well, um, that is all the time we have today. Um, once again, let's uh, cheer. Let's give it up for <laughs> Diblik. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. I have so much fun talking about aerospace. This is great. Um, and yeah, if you take a peek at the chat, Diblik, uh, feel free to stop sharing your screen. Um, oh, yeah. Chat. I'm trying to yeah. figure out how to stop. Oh, there I see. <laughs> trying to figure oh. out how to stop sharing my screen. Oh, oh yeah, you're fine. Um, Diblik and Keisha, if you can stay on. Everyone else, thank you so much for coming. Um, don't forget about our public speaking workshop. Uh, we have that 80% discount code. Um, and I will, of course, blast that out again through meetup.com. Uh, but please think about joining that uh, public speaking workshop because that is quite the deal. Uh, it's quite the opportunity. Uh, we don't know if that's going to pop up again, but I think it's going to benefit all of you. Um, thank you all to all your great questions. Please connect with each other, and we'll see you next time in April where we talk about design file hygiene. I know y'all not naming your layers. You better show up. <laughs> so, um, yes. and what is going to be talking about that and how to um, organize your files, naming conventions, back best practices around them from a philosophical standpoint. Join us next time. All right, bye guys. And uh, Dibba and Keisha, stay on board. Yes. Thank See you guys. Everyone. Bye guys. And I- Bye. Yep, and if you're sticking around, don't don't take it personal if I kick you out. <laughs> I'm going to, there. Sorry, uh, about now, do you prefer that I send you an email later? Yes, please. Um, send okay, an yeah, email, perfect. send a DM, whatever works, and I'll get you this book, okay? Perfect, thank you. Perfect, thanks, Daniela. There you go. I was getting a 10 with my other land. <laughs> All right, so, Rania. Good night, y'all. Bye, Rania. Bye. Thanks for coming. See you next time. See you next time. <laughs> Diblik, how do you feel? I feel really good. It was really exciting. Oh, God.